Hi. Um, very excited to be here. Thanks, uh, Debbie, for that great introduction. And thank you to the Transition Network for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, very excited to have an excuse to put clothes on. Um, and happy Cinco de Mayo. Uh, I just, nothing about Dorothy Parker is in particular connected to Cinco de Mayo, except that Ms. Parker definitely knew how to celebrate. Um, and she once did say, um, uh, one more drink and I'd have been under the host. So uh, that's my Dorothy Parker connection to celebration. But welcome to this. I'm very excited to talk to you about the sides of Dorothy Parker you don't know. Um, and as Debbie said, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about me. I am an author. I'm a novelist. And my two most recent novels, I've resurrected the ghost of Dorothy Parker in a contemporary setting. So as the author of those books, I did spend a number of years researching Dorothy Parker. I also am a lifetime fan of Dorothy Parker's, which is what got me interested in her to begin with. Um, I'll give you my website in the end if you want any more information about me, but it's ellenmeister.com. So, okay, without further ado about me, um, I'm going to get right into talking to you about Dorothy Parker. Now, this is usually the part of the presentation where I ask for a show of hands and I ask people, uh, you know, who's, who in the group is familiar with Dorothy Parker? I'm going to assume in this very educated professional group that most of you are familiar with Dorothy Parker, but I hope that I'm going to open you up to some things that you don't know about Dorothy Parker. Of course, she was the most famous literary wit of the 20th century. And before I get into anything else, I'm just going to go over some of her most famous quotes, some of which you probably know. For instance, the first thing I do in the morning is brush my teeth and sharpen my tongue. She also famously answered her telephone by saying, what fresh hell is this? It's a favorite among a lot of people. Upon hearing the famously taciturn President Coolidge had died, Dorothy Parker said, how could they tell? And famous for her insult, she once said, that woman speaks 18 languages and can't say no in any of them. So let's talk a little bit about Parker's legacy. She was a poet, a theater critic, a book reviewer, a short story writer, an essayist, and here's something that a lot of people don't know about Dorothy Parker, she was a screenwriter. She did spend several years in Hollywood as a screenwriter. Uh, she doesn't have a lot of credits because really in those days, the studio system was such that a lot of people worked on movies and didn't get credits. However, you will find her credit on a very famous movie called A Star is Born. So that was the 1937 version uh, with Frederick uh, March and Janet Gaynor, for which she actually won an Oscar. She also worked on a Hitchcock movie, one of the lesser known Hitchcock movies called Saboteur. I'd like to bring that up in case you ever have a chance to watch Saboteur. And the reason is because all these years after Dorothy Parker's death, as far as I know, there does not exist one single film clip of Dorothy Parker speaking, except for the small cameo she makes in Saboteur. So if you watch it, keep an eye out for a scene that happens on the side of the road where Dorothy Parker makes a sort of funny remark. And that's all I'm gonna say. I hope you keep it in the back of your mind and maybe one of these days you'll, you'll watch Saboteur. Okay, so as a poet, I'm going to give you just a few examples of her glorious poetry, um, most of which is extremely witty. So she had a famous poem called Indian Summer. In youth, it was a way I had to do my best to please and change with every passing lad to suit his theories. But now I know the things I know and do the things I do. And if you do not like me so, to hell my love with you. When you hear these, po these poems and her sarcasm, 
and her take on, her very cynical take on love, you might understand why um, her poetry was what first drew me to her uh, as, a, as a teenager. Okay. And here's a great, completely sarcastic poem called Comment. Oh, life is a glorious cycle of song, a medley of extemporanea, and love is a thing that can never go wrong, and I am Marie of Romania. This next poem sort of speaks to me personally. It's called Bohemia. Authors and actors and artists and such never know nothing and never know much. Sculptors and singers and those of their kidney tell their affairs from Seattle to Sydney. Playwrights and poets and such horses necks start off from anywhere, end up at sex. Diarists, critics, and similar row never say nothing and never say no. People who do things exceed my endurance. God, for a man that solicits insurance. I think it's the initial caps on people who do things that uh, excites me so much about that poem. And now, to the poem that you probably know, her most famous poem, Resume. This one's dark. Razors pain you, rivers are damp, acids stain you, and drugs cause cramp. Guns aren't lawful, nooses give, gas smells awful, you might as well live. Now, when you ask people um, what Dorothy Parker's most famous poem is, they'll usually tell you that it's resume. However, I contend that she does have a more famous poem, and I contend that you know it, and probably you didn't even know it was a poem, but you've probably been hearing it all your life. And here it is. Men seldom make passes at girls who wear glasses. You've heard that one, right? Okay, so let's talk about Dorothy Parker's role as a critic. She once famously said, and I'll tell you, this is the quote that everybody uh, loves to um, reference, although it's, it's one of those things that's been passed out verbally. It's not in any written review of hers, but it's still great. She once said about a certain book, this is not a novel to be tossed aside lightly. It should be thrown with great force. Unfortunately, it's lost to history what particular book she was talking about. Um, also, as a theater critic, Dorothy Parker had seen young Katherine Hepburn in a very early stage performance and had said about her, Katherine Hepburn ran the gamut of emotions from A to B. And seeing a play called The House Beautiful, she said, The House Beautiful is, for me, the play lousy. Okay, so Dorothy Parker spent a lot of years as a book reviewer, and she worked for uh, The New Yorker as a book reviewer, not writing under her own name. She wrote under the name Constant Reader. Okay, so Constant Reader, as it happened, had the exact same taste in books as Dorothy Parker, which is to say she had absolutely uh, no tolerance and, 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 and no love of whimsy, okay? So when she reviewed A.A. A. Milne's The House at Pooh Corner as Constant Reader, here is what she wrote, quoting from the book. Tiddly what? said Piglet. He took, as you might say, the very words out of your correspondent's mouth. Palm, said Pooh, I put that in to make it more hummy. And it is that word hummy, my darlings, that marks the first place in the house at Pooh Corner at which Constant Weeder flowed up. Okay, as a short story writer, Dorothy Parker did publish quite a number of short stories, never published a novel, but published a number of short stories. And her most famous story was Big Blonde, for which she won an O. Henry Award in 1929. But I'm just gonna give you two call out quotes from some other stories. There was a story she wrote called A Telephone Call. And here's a quote from that. 
I was always sweet at first. Oh, it's so easy to be sweet to people before you love them. And this next quote, which I think is just lovely, is from a story called Dusk Before Fireworks. His voice was as intimate as the rustle of sheets. All right, so as an essayist, Dorothy Parker really excelled. And it's sort of unfortunate that a lot of people don't know about her essays because there she did some of her most gorgeous writing. I am going to now um, read you an excerpt from an essay she wrote, uh, it, which was published in 1928 in McCall's Magazine. This essay is called My Hometown. It's a little bit longer. Um, I'm going to give you more than I I usually give in an excerpt, but the writing is so exquisite. I really wanted to showcase it here to show you the kind of depth uh, that Dorothy Parker had in her writing. Also, I think right now at this particular moment in history, it seems kind of appropriate to uh, offer up a love letter to New York. So here is the uh, excerpt from this essay, My Hometown. It occurs to me that there are other towns. It occurs to me so violently that I say to, at intervals, very well, if New York is going to be like this, I'm going to live someplace else. And I do. That's the funny part of it. But then one day there comes to me the sharp picture of New York at its best on a shiny blue and white autumn day with its buildings cut diagonally in halves of light and shadow, with its straight, neat avenues colored with quick throngs, like confetti in a breeze. Someone, and I wish it had been I, has said that autumn is the springtime of big cities. I see New York at holiday time, always in the late afternoon under a Maxfield Parish sky, with the crowds even more quick and nervous, but even more good-natured, the dark groups splashed with the white of Christmas packages, the holly, the lighted holly-strung shops, urging them in to buy more and more. I see it on a spring morning, with the clothes of the women, as soft and as hopeful as the pretty new leaves on a few brave trees. I see it at night, with the low skies red, with the black flung lights of Broadway. Those lights of which Chesterton, or they told me it was Chesterton said, what a marvelous sight for those who cannot read. I see it in the rain. I smell the enchanting odor of wet asphalt with the streets black and shining as ripe olives. I see it, by this time I become maudlin with nostalgia even with its gray mounds of crusted snow, its little Appalachians of ice always along the pavements. So I go back, and it is always better than I thought it would be. I suppose that is the thing about New York. It is always a little more than you would hope for. Each day there is so definitely a new day. Now we'll start over, it seems to say every morning, and come on, let's hurry like anything. London is satisfied. Paris is resigned. But New York is always hopeful. Always it believes that something good is about to come off, and it must hurry to meet it. There is excitement ever running in its streets. Each day as you go out, you feel the little nervous quiver that is yours when you sit in the theater just before the curtain rises. Other places may give you a sweet and soothing sense of level, but in New York, there is always the feeling of something's going to happen. It is in peace, but you know, you do get used to peace and so quickly, and you never get used to New York. I do hope that you uh, love that little piece of writing as much as I did and are impressed with it. So now I'm going to move on to talking about Dorothy Parker's early life. She was born in 1893 in West End, New Jersey, the youngest of four children. 
Uh, she was born uh, not as Dorothy Parker, but as Dorothy Rothschild, no relation to the famous uh, wealthy Rothschilds. Her father was of German Jewish descent. Her mother was uh, Protestant Scottish descent. Her mother died when she was four years old. Her father remarried a woman she wasn't fond of and always insisted on calling Mrs. Rothschild, nothing else. Uh, and then the stepmother died when she was nine. So Parker had a lot of death in her young life. Um, she attended a Roman Catholic elementary school and dropped out of finishing school at age 14. Now, I, um, I, I just want to give you a little bit of, a, of an aside on the whole business about the finishing school. And later on, I'm going to get into why there was so little... Um, there's so little materials about Dorothy Parker. There's very little biographical information on her, though there is a wonderful biography written by Mary and Mead about her, but her, her personal papers were all destroyed at some point. But that said, what, the, what little facts we know, we can take and extrapolate, and probably because I'm a novelist and I tend to, you know, fill in fact with, with a little bit of fiction, I do connect the dots in certain ways that may or may not be factual. Here's what we know. We know that Dorothy Parker, uh, Dorothy Rothschild at the time, was very excited as a young teenager to attend this finishing school. We know that she was the only Jewish child in this finishing school. We know that it was a time of virulent anti-Semitism in the United States. And we know that this girl who was very excited about going to this school never went back after her first year. And that was the end of her formal education. Can we assume that anti-Semitism played a part in her decision not to go back, that she wasn't treated well by the other children? It's hard to say, you know, like I said, as a novelist, I tend to make that leap. Um, but what we do know is as educated and as well-read and as literate as she was, that was the end of her formal education. So, um, Let's talk about um, her early career. He became a writer for Vogue magazine in 1914. And here's how that came about. Dorothy Parker was 19 years old when her father died. Um, and uh, at that point, she went to live with her, her older sister, Helen, who was married and, and had a child. And what she was doing for a living, well, there weren't many options available to young women in those days, was she was playing the piano, believe it or not, at dance, as dance halls in New York City. Dance uh, studios were very popular then. People wanted to learn how to do the castle walk. So that's what she was doing. It wasn't what she wanted to do. She wanted to be a writer. She romanticized the writer's life. So while she was doing that, living with her sister and uh, working, playing the piano at these dance halls, she wrote poetry. And she sent them out to various uh, magazines and literary publications, one of which was a very urbane, sophisticated New York publication called Vanity Fair. After getting numerous rejections from many places, she got an acceptance, her first acceptance, for a poem at Vanity Fair and a check to go along with it. Very exciting moment for her. And what did she do? She put on her best suit. And she went to the offices of Vanity Fair and she paid a call on the editor in chief who was named Frank Crowninshield. He was very impressed with her and told her if something opened up, he would get in touch with her. As it happened a few months later, a position opened up in Vanity Fair's sister publication, Vogue. It was really an editorial assistant position, but one of the things that she did was writing captions for the fashions in Vogue. And yes, Vogue was a fashion magazine from its very inception. Um, so um, she is well known for having uh, been given the task of writing a caption for a piece of flimsy, uh, uh, for a ne flimsy negligee, which she captioned, brevity is the soul of lingerie. And Somehow we know that here's another uh, caption that she wrote that didn't make the magazine. It got booted because it was a little too risque. But she did write, 
There was a little girl who had a little curl right in the middle of her forehead. When she was good, she was very, very good. But when she was bad, she wore this divine nightdress of rose-colored mousseline de soie trimmed with frosty Valenciennes lace. Um, you were not allowed to insinuate that ladies actually had sex back then, so that one was next. Um, but okay, in 1918, she moved to Vanity Fair, um, and uh, Frank Crowninshield was now her official boss. He didn't quite know what to do with this young woman whose talent he was in awe of. But as luck would have it, um, his theater critic went on a hiatus at that point. And so Dorothy Parker at age 24 became the theater critic for Vanity Fair. Her voice, her reviews were absolutely extraordinary. Her voice was so irreverent, so fresh. I'm telling you, you could pick it up today and it would not feel dated. It would feel fresh and funny and irreverent. It's extraordinary. I mean, you know, a hundred years later, how, how fresh her voice remains. So you can imagine that she took New York by storm and really at age 24 was the toast of the town. While she was at um, Vanity Fair, she met her coworkers, Robert Benchley and Robert Sherwood, with whom she became lifelong friends. Shortly after meeting them and becoming friends with them, uh, she was invited to a lunch at the Algonquin Hotel. You have probably heard of the Algonquin Roundtable. We're going to talk a little bit about that now. Uh, suffice to say, uh, she brought Mr. Sherwood always called each other Mr. and Mrs. Mr. Sher Sherwood and, and, uh, and Mr. Benchley along with her to that luncheon. So um, I do want to talk a little bit about um, who the members of the Algonquin Roundtable were. Um, you know, they were a celebrated group of wits who met daily for, for lunch for 10 years. And I just want to go through this photograph, or this photograph, this uh, cartoon by, by the famous cartoonist Hirschfeld. And who was in this, and by the way, the members of the Aranka Roundtable, not everybody was at every lunch every day. They were a core group of people that wandered in and out, and you might see them at, at any given time, and you might not. But okay. The lady with the dark hair on the left, that is Dorothy Parker herself going clockwise and up, so up and around to her right, the gentleman with the mustache, that is her friend, Robert Benchley, who became a very famous humorist. Next to him in the round glasses, that is the New York Times theater critic, Alexander Wolcott. Next to Wolcott is a sports columnist named Haywood Broon. You might not know that name, but back then people did. He was a very famous sports columnist. Uh, next to Brune with the bald head is playwright Mark Connolly. Next to Connolly with the cigar over all the way on the right, that's Franklin Pierce Adams, who had a newspaper column and quoted the members of the Algonquin Roundtable in his column and really was the one that made their witticism so famous. Um, coming down around the table, uh, the woman on the right in the hat is Edna Ferber, who is a novelist and playwright. You probably know her, uh, if anything, for, for Showboat, her novel that was turned into a musical. Next to her, we, the curly-haired man, that's George S. Kaufman, the famous punster who wrote many of the Marx Brothers movies. And next to him is her friend Robert Sherwood, who went on to become a playwright. And now I'm going to talk about who's in the background. The couple on the left, that is the acting duo of uh, Lund and Fontaine. For many years, I thought that was Tallulah Bankhead because um, even as a teenager, because she was a teenager staying with the, at the Algonquin Hotel when these people met. So she was a sometimes member of the Algonquin Roundtable. Uh, but it is not, in fact, Tallulah. It's Lund and Fontaine. And standing up next to them uh, in the checkered coat, that's Frank Crown and Shield, who was Dorothy Parker's boss at Vanity Fair. And then all the way on the right, that, that gentleman is Frank Case, who was the manager of the Algonquin Hotel. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the origins of the Algonquin Roundtable. 
It began in 1919 as a practical joke played on Alexander Wolcott by a publicist named John Peter Toohey, who was actually a little miffed at Wolcott and thought it would be funny to pretend to throw him a welcome home from the war. This was just after World War I uh, party, when it was really kind of a, a roast. Uh, but Wolcott absolutely loved it, and it became a regular uh, daily event for 10 years. Okay, it didn't, uh, wasn't always at a round table. It started at just a regular rectangular table in what is now called the Oak Room. Um, and it wasn't always called the Algonquin Round Table. They started out being called the board. And then, and I'll explain why this was so clever, the Luigi board. Now their waiter, <laughs> their regular waiter was named Luigi. And it just so happened that at that period in time, Ouija boards were a tremendous craze. So calling it the Luigi board was a, was a great pun. Uh, Dorothy Parker, uh, because everybody there has such a sharp tongue, liked to call it the vicious circle. Um, at any rate, the luncheons continued until 1929. Now I'm going to give you just um, uh, some quotes from some of the uh, famous members of the Algonquin Roundtable. Alexander Wolcott said, famously, all the things I like to do are either immoral, illegal, or fattening. He also said about actors and prostitutes, the two oldest professions in the world, ruined by amateurs. Mark Connolly. So one time, Somebody walked in, wanted to insult Connolly and walked into the Algonquin and rubbed his hand over Connolly's bald pate and said, you know, Mark, your head feels as smooth as my wife's behind. Without missing a beat, Connolly felt his own scalp and replied, so it does. Okay, Robert Benchley, on discussing a Broadway show, said, it was one of those plays in which all the actors unfortunate, unfortunately enunciated very clearly. I do want to add an aside here that he was probably Dorothy Parker's dearest friend. Um, Benchley also said, there may be said to be two kinds of people in the world, those who constantly divide the people of the world into two classes and those who do not. Now, Tallulah Bankhead. It's a little bit, she was so risque, so bawdy. It's a little bit hard to find quotes that are suitable for sharing. Uh, so I'll just give you this one. She said, I'm as pure as the driven slush. And indeed she was. And just one more, pushing the envelope just a little bit here. She once said, I'll come and make love to you at five o'clock. If I'm late, start without me. Okay, sports writer um, and short story writer, who was actually beautiful at writing voices, Ring Lardner said, he looked at me as if I were a side dish he hadn't ordered. And also this. Shut up, he explained. And George S. Kaufman, the playwright and punster who wrote for, for the Marx Brothers for many years, said, I like terra firma. The more firma, the less terra. He also said to a playwright friend of his, I understand your new play is full of single entendres. Okay, Edna Ferber, uh, who was a very popular uh, <clears throat> novelist back then, um, she was one day dressed in a tailor jacket and Noel, Noel Coward came into the room wearing the, the same kind of jacket, dressed the same kind of suit. And he, when he saw her, he said, Edna, you look almost like a man in that suit. To which she replied, so do you, Noel. See, they were, they were all pretty cutting. Okay. Her friend Robert Sherwood uh, said about the cowboy Tom Mix, they say he rides as if he's part of the horse but they don't say which part. Franklin Pierce Adams is famous for having said, nothing is more responsible for the good old days than a bad old memory. And Dorothy Parker herself, 
was probably the wittiest of them all, on being asked to use the word horticulture in a sentence said, you can lead a horticulture, but you can't make her think. She also said, you can't teach an old dogma new tricks. And as I said at the beginning, one more drink and I'd have been under the host. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about Dorothy Parker's marriages. As I said, she started out life as Dorothy Rothschild, and then she met a stockbroker named uh, Edwin Pond Parker III. Um, so he went off to uh, war shortly after they were married. But what she said about their uh, marrying him was that Parker was a good, clean name. Of course, what she meant was that it was not a Jewish name. Um, it was a very tumultuous, troubled relationship. Dorothy Parker was the kind of person who was pretty needy in love. Um, Eddie Parker was the type that really couldn't give very much. Also, he was an alcoholic and he left for the war an alcoholic and returned a morphine addict. Not uncommon in World War I where uh, morphine was more accessible on the front than alcohol was. And uh, he was in and out of uh, sanatoriums trying to kick his morphine habit after he returned home from the war. Um, and their troubled marriage uh, ended in 1928. In 1934, at the age of 40, uh, she married a younger man, a writer, actor named Alan Campbell. It was a complicated relationship. Um, and this is also one of those things that's kind of lost to history. It's rumored that Alan may have been a homosexual or a bisexual. Of course, in those days, um, it was not just career ending, but illegal. So it, if it were true, it wasn't written, not in a letter, not in anything. It wasn't insinuated. So we don't know. We don't know for a fact um, whether any of that is true. Um, but it was what people in Hollywood and in the New York circle uh, said uh, about Alan Campbell. Um, we do know that he loved Dorothy Parker and he doted on Dorothy Parker and they were screenwriting partners in Hollywood. Um, they were together in, uh, with a team that worked on that 1937 version of A Star is Born. Um, interestingly, they divorced in 1947 and then remarried in 1950. But when they remarried, um, they said that it <clears throat> was less a marriage than a partnership. Um, and the tr very tragic part of the story is that Alan Campbell committed suicide in 1963. Dorothy Parker found him with an empty bottle of second all and a plastic dry cleaners bag wrapped around his head. Um, and despite the evidence, Dorothy disputed the accounts that uh, his suicide was intentional. So complicated. Um, now I want to move on to talking about Dorothy Parker's social conscience. And fortunately, we do have this um, piece from uh, that she wrote in 1939 which sort of gives us a glimpse into her awakening as a young child. So this is just a, an excerpt from um, a piece that she wrote for a publication called New Masses. I think I first knew what side I was on when I was about five years old, at which time nobody was safe from buffaloes. By the way, that's that buffaloes line is a recurring motif. It was kind of her way of saying, you know, back when Dinosaurs roamed the earth. Um, it was in a brownstone house in New York, and there was a blizzard, and my rich aunt, a horrible woman then and now, had come to visit. I remember going to the window and seeing the street with the men shoveling snow. Their hands were purple on their shovels, and their feet were wrapped in burlap. And my aunt, looking over her shoulder, said, now, isn't this nice that there's this blizzard? Now all those men have work. And I knew then, 
that it was not nice that men could work for their lives only in desperate weather, that there was no work for them in fair. And that's when I became anti-fascist at the silky tones of my rich and comfortable hands. So people often ask me if Dorothy Parker was a feminist, and I say that indeed she was a feminist, and yes, it was a term that was uh, used uh, during the uh, suffrage movement. And I do have a quote from her uh, from uh, a 1956 interview she did in Paris Review, where she said, I was a feminist, and you must remember uh, that from the very early days when this city was scarcely safe from buffaloes, there she goes again, I was in the struggle for equal rights for women. We paraded through the catcalls of men and we chained ourselves to lampposts to try to get our equality. Okay. Um, going back to uh, Dorothy Parker's social conscience. You know, there was a famous murder trial in 1920 of Sacco and Vanzetti, two Italian immigrant uh, um, anarchists who were tried and convicted of m murder. They were sentenced to death in 1927. And the judge said, I'm going to get those anarchists good and proper. So it was very clear that there was a great injustice being done here by a judge with a political ax to grind against these men. And Dorothy Parker just couldn't sit back and, and let this happen. And so unable to bear the miscarriage of justice, in 1927, Parker traveled to Boston to protest the execution. She was taunted by people on the street, who called her a Bolshevik, a guinea lover, a New York nut, red scum. I was, she was dragged away. They said, hang her, give her six months, kill her. So yeah, she was arrested. Uh, and when someone asked her if the police had taken her fingerprints, she said, no, but they left me a few of theirs, the big steps. And then she pushed up her sleeves to show the bruises. Um, she was proud of having been arrested and uh, eventually she uh, pleaded guilty and received a $5 fine for loitering, uh, loitering and sauntering and was released. Um, a decade later, she was in Hollywood and finally earning enough money to afford a luxurious lifestyle. She fought for the fledgling Screenwriters Guild to help writers who didn't have her clout with the notorious studio executives. Um, this was uh, violently opposed by the studios who tried to convince writers to join a rival studio created union. About that, Parker said, expecting studios to represent the rights of writers was like trying to get laid in your mother's house. Somebody was always in the parlor watching. The scope of her awareness reached beyond Hollywood, and she was also involved in raising defense funds for the Scottsboro Boys, nine African-American teenagers who were accused of raping two women in Alabama. I'm just going to read you uh, one little excerpt from Wikipedia about that case, because a lot of people don't know about it. Um, the Scottsboro Boys were nine black teenagers falsely accused in Alabama of raping two white American women on a train in 1931. The landmark set of legal cases from this incident dealt with racism and right to a fair trial. The cases included a lynch mob before the subjects had been indicted, a frame up, all white juries, rushed trials, and disruptive mobs. It is frequently cited as an example of an overall miscarriage of justice in the United States legal system. Um, soon, Parker's uh, attention was uh, drawn to uh, what was happening in Europe as uh, uh, Nazism swept through, and she was instrumental in founding the Hollywood Anti-Nazi League. Um, as you can imagine, 
Um, Dorothy Parker caught the attention of the House Un-American Activities Committee. Um, hang on one second. My phone decided to unsilence itself. Okay. Um, so, yeah, her friends began falling victim to McCarthyism, some of them serving prison sentences. And Parker couldn't hold back. In 1947, she delivered provocative remarks at a rally to raise defense funds for her fellow writers. She informed the audience she had come to damn the souls of the committee and its chairman. The next day, she read in the New York Daily News uh, at the, uh, that the House Un-American Activities Committee planned to subpoena her. She was undeterred and went to Washington to attend several hearings and wasn't shy about voicing her disgust. Later, at a fundraising reception in New York, she said, for heaven's sake, children, fascism isn't coming. It's here. It's dreadful. Stop it. Um, as it happened, the um, uh, agents from the House on American Activities Committee didn't visit her home until 1951. When they did, they peppered her with questions about her friends, asked if she ever attended a Communist Party meeting. They pulled out press clippings with quotes and innuendos about her involvement. Throughout this whole interrogation, her little dog, Misty, kept jumping and barking and jumping and barking on the agents. Um, and when they asked her if she ever conspired to overthrow the US government, she replied, listen, I can't get my dog to stay down. Do I look to you like someone who can overthrow the government? Uh, she was called to the witness stand in 1955 and invoked the Fifth Amendment. Uh, the committee eventually decided that there wasn't enough uh, evidence. She wasn't danger enough, dangerous enough to arrest. Um, but, you know, like most people who were called before the committee, her career was derailed for an entire decade. Um, and now I'm going to move on to Dorothy Parker's final chapter, and I call this The Last Stand. So the final years of her life, she was not a healthy woman um, and was definitely not well enough to march on Selma or anywhere else. However, uh, from the uh, hotel room where she lived, she was able to watch Martin Luther King Jr. and the Civil Rights Movement with great interest. Um, it moved her so much that in 1965, she met with her lawyer to draw up her will. Um, there were no charitable donations, no bequests or sentimental trinkets to friends or relatives. In fact, just a single individual was mentioned. It was someone she hadn't met, a total stranger. It was Martin Luther King Jr. She bequeathed her entire estate to him and specified that upon his death, um, her estate would pass to uh, the NAACP. As it happens, Dorothy Parker died in 1967, and um, Dr. King was assassinated in 1968. And so that is what happened to her estate. Um, then a really interesting chapter. See, Dorothy Parker, Dorothy Parker's story is just as interesting in death as it was in life. The writer Lillian Hellman was Dorothy Parker's executor. And I just want to give you a little bit of background on their relationship. Uh, Hellman was, was younger than Dorothy Parker. Um, the two met at a Greenwich Village cocktail party in 1931. Lillian Hellman, famous, very famous playwright, her significant other was the writer Dashiell Hammett. So it just so happened that Dorothy Parker was an enormous fan of Dashiell Hammett. And just a few months before this meeting, she'd written a review of one of his books and had called him, quote, as American as a sawed-off shotgun uh, and said there was entirely too little screaming about his work. At this party, she was just tipsy enough to fall on her knees in front of Dashiell Hammett and make a big fuss. This did not uh, endear her to Lillian Hellman, who actually got into a fight with Dashiell Hammett after the party, um, saying she couldn't live with a man who just stood and simpered when the famous woman kissed his hand in public. 
apparently they got over the fight and also things improved between Dorothy Parker and Lillian Hellman. You know, they really had so much in common. They were both provocateurs. They both understood the importance of organizing the screen union. They were obsessed with the larger issues of capitalism and communism and the specter of fascism in Europe. Um, and they were the two most famous women writers of their day. So when they met again in 1934, they did become very dear friends. Uh, they enjoyed each other's company. They did have one sore point in their relationship, which was Dorothy's husband, Alan Campbell, whom Lillian was not at all fond of and wasn't, you know, quiet about it. Dot um, forgave Lillian for her dislike of Alan. Once after Lillian apologized for snapping at him by saying he made her nervous, Dorothy replied, Dear Lily, you'd be psychotic if you didn't. Um, so just to show how, how the high regard Dorothy had for Lillian Hellman, she inscribed her book, The Portable Dorothy Parker for Lillian Hellman by saying, for Miss Hellman, the most beautiful, the most rich, the most chic, the most dashing, the most fragrant, the most nobly born, the most elegant, the most cryptic, the most startling, the most glorious, the most lovely, in short, for Miss Hellman from Miss Parker. So now, um, Dorothy Parker died in uh, 19, June 1967. Um, Hellman was the executor of the estate and was quite surprised by the contents of Dorothy Parker's will because she thought that she was going to inherit Dorothy Parker's estate. Um, there wasn't, like I said, there wasn't really much in Parker's will, but one of the things she said was that she didn't want any kind of a funeral, um, formal or casual, and the first thing Hellman did was throw her a massive, you know, star-studded funeral with herself as, as, the, as the star, you know, performer. Um, she also tried to block the writing of a biography on Parker, telling everyone who was uh, approached by the author not to speak with him. Also, it's been noted that everything, and I said this at the beginning, um, and I'm, I'm circling back to it now, pretty much every piece of paper connected to Dorothy Parker has been destroyed. Nothing remains. Uh, Lillian was the one who had cleaned out Parker's apartment and had absolutely everything destroyed. Um, however, Hellman was less thorough regarding Parker's final remains. Parker did provide for the expenses of her cremation, but had not specified anything about an urn, and so her ashes wound up in a coffee can-like container. Um, Parker also had neglected to make arrangements for a final resting place for her ashes, even though her family owned a, a, a you know, a funeral, a, a cemetery plot. So after the funeral, Lillian never claimed Dorothy's ashes and ignored questions from the funeral home about what to do with them. Um, so, uh, um, you know, finally in 1973, home ran out of patience and demanded a response from Lillian. Lily told the remains to the lawyer's office on Wall Street. There they stayed until 1987, three years after Hellman's death, right? Remember, this is 20 years after Parker's death. So uh, Marion Mead, who wrote a, a wonderful biography on Parker, um, had wanted to, you know, visit Dorothy Parker's final resting place. And she was on the phone with a lawyer, Paul O'Dwyer, and she told him that she was preparing to visit Parker's grave uh, in her family's burial plot in Ferncliff. And uh, the lawyer said, oh, she's not there. And, uh, you know, me, who knew that her family owned a plot, said, of course she is. You know, where else would she be? And he said, well, I'm looking right at her. He had her in his office, he said, and then proceeded to explain how the unclaimed ashes ended up in his care. Uh, the ashes were finally interred uh, at the headquarters of the NAACP in Baltimore. So Dorothy Parker, who was born in New Jersey only as a, a, an accident of timing because her 
New York City family happened to be on vacation when her mother gave birth to her, uh, was born in New Jersey, this lifelong New Yorker, and is buried in Baltimore, but with an absolutely wonderful plaque from the NAACP, which says, here lie the ashes of Dorothy Parker, humorist, writer, critic, defender of human rights, of human and civil rights. For her epitaph, she suggested, excuse my dust, this memorial garden is dedicated to her noble spirit, which celebrated the oneness of humankind and to the bonds of everlasting friendship between Black and Jewish people, dedicated by the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, October 20th, 1988. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this. That brings us to the end of my you know, presentation. Uh, just a final little word about me. I do have these two Dorothy Parker books. If you're looking for something to read, I know right now during this, uh, this, this quarantine, this lockdown, a lot of people are looking for something to read. And I do like to think that they're sort of fun escapist entertainment and available in all formats and for order wherever you order books. That's my little personal commercial. Also, my publisher would kill me if I didn't mention that I have a new book coming out in August. It's called Love Sold Separately. It's my first murder mystery. So that, that's pretty exciting for me. As you can probably glean from the cover, it's not one of those dark noir thrillers. It's actually a fun, light murder mystery. I have it taking place at a fictional shopping channel. I'm really proud of the book. I hope you'll be interested in it. It comes out August 25th. Um, and if you sign up for my mailing list, I'm happy to send you information on it. I don't send out a lot of emails, so you won't get inundated. However, you will. Um, get information about an upcoming giveaway. So I hope you'll click on my website, ellenmeister.com, and um, click subscribe and subscribe to my mailing list. And if you want to contact me, uh, there's a contact form there. And I just, I'd love to hear from people. So feel free to reach out. Uh, like I said, I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear from you folks, especially after a program like this, where you know, I'm so accustomed to connecting to people with their Q&A at the end, and I, I can't really hear your voices and connect with you. But I am going to turn it over to Debbie now, who I think has got some questions that you guys have typed in. Uh, yes, I have some uh, comments, actually, mostly, okay. um, which people have been sending throughout. Uh, they seem to be enjoying your talk. Uh, so... Uh, Let's see, earlier on, uh, Marlene said uh, about the New York essay. That was beautiful, especially today. I miss New York so much. And Donna said, I agree, a beautiful essay about New York. And then Sally, I believe she's quoting Dorothy Parker. Upon my honor, I saw a Madonna standing in a niche above the door of the private whore of the world's worst son of a bitch in the guest book on leaving Hearst Castle. Um, and then a question from... I'm not 100% sure it's authentic, but it's a great quote. <laughs> it is. Thank you, Sally. <laughs> Thank you, Sally. Um, and then uh, Judy said... Is there a sense as to why she did not have children? One can surmise, but. And please keep yeah. sending your, your questions. We have a little bit of time for a few more questions, so. Okay. Um, yeah, she actually wanted children. Um, there was a time that she got pregnant. Um, she was separated, but not divorced yet from um, Edwin Parker, and she got pregnant by another man. Um, and uh, she, uh, she had an abortion. She said, it serves me right for putting all my eggs in one bastard. But after that uh, incident, she was not able to get pregnant. She was married to Alan. She did suffer a few uh, miscarriages. So she did really want children. And it, it never happened for her. Uh, she, you know, she had a lot of misfortune in her life. And she definitely suffered depression, I think. Uh, you know, she's, she's famous for having uh, been a huge drinker, which she absolutely was. She was drunk a lot of the time. 
you know, I suspect that she was probably an undiagnosed, um, you know, clinical depressed, clinically depressed person. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of sadness in her life. She, she uh, just to go off on a little tangent, one thing I don't put in the presentation, there were several suicide attempts in her life. Um, you know, not pretty, slitting her wrists, drinking uh, boot polish, which was a common, uh, which was, you know, poisonous and a common way to attempt suicide in those days, and it got her very sick. So, um, yeah, she was, she was very funny and had a lot of depth and also a lot of sadness. Uh, Donna asks, was Dorothy Parker an influence on Edna St. Vincent Millay? Uh, the other way around. <laughs> Edna St. Vincent Millay was, a, was, a, was an influence on Dorothy Parker, who, when she wrote her poem, said, I was following in the, magnif in the exquisite footsteps of Edna St. Vincent Millay unhappily in my own horrible sneakers. So, yeah, she was okay. a great Okay, all right, so I'm, I'm gonna, just going to ask you the last, the last question. Um, okay. of what, what, what inspired you the most about writing the two novels about Dorothy Parker? Oh, uh, yeah, so, you know, like I said, I was a lifelong fan of Dorothy Parker, starting when I was a teenager. I never stopped reading her poems, her stories, her essays, everything. And, you know, there was, there was a time in my life I was actually working on another novel when I was just thinking about the fact that there were, oh, there was a whole slew of wonderful books um, that paid homage to Jane Austen. I'm also a big fan of Jane Austen. I think it's great, but you all know what I was talking about, what I'm talking about. There were ones that were almost like fan fiction that sort of took off on novels that she wrote. And there were things where Jane Austen was a character and I was just sort of pondering that. And I thought, gee, well, I mean, it's great because I love Jane Austen. I, and I still read Jane Austen. But I was thinking, why only Jane Austen? Why aren't there any books that pay homage to other great women authors like Dorothy Parker? And then I said, oh, well, <laughs> maybe I should do it. And the minute I said it, I had an image of the ghost of Dorothy Parker sitting in the chair of a suburban woman's living room and offering her counsel and advice. And that was the beginning of uh, Farewell Dorothy Parker, which was going to be a standalone book. I didn't have any intention of writing a series, but um, my publisher after that came out asked me, would I consider writing a sequel? Uh, I, I did. I felt like I wasn't finished with Dorothy Parker. She was still sort of on my shoulder talking to me. But Farewell Dorothy Parker ended so definitively, it didn't lend itself to a sequel. What I did was I wrote a quick prequel. So Dorothy Parker Drank Here was written second, but it actually happens before the other novels. So if you're interested, toss a coin. You can read them in any order. It's it's fine. But but thank you for that question. Um, it was It was a great honor to uh, resurrect Dorothy Parker as a character. And I really felt a great sense of wanting to pay responsible tribute to her, not just showing her as the sort of one dimensional scathing wit. I wanted to show all the depth and all the layers there were to her, which is one of the reasons I wanted to come up with this presentation that showed how wonderful her writing was, how deep her writing was, but also um, the kind of heart she had and the kind of social conscience that she had. All right, well, thank you, Alan, for a really wonderful presentation. And thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Let's all raise a glass or a Cinco de Mayo toast to Dorothy Parker. Please stay safe and well. Thank you, everybody. Bye, thank you.